Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the molecular basis of contraction and then we'll finish with a summary. So the way that muscles contract use an important sequence of events which involves interaction of particular molecules. So remember the unit of contraction for a muscle is called a sarcomere and they have to shorten in length or contract for the whole muscle to become shorter. And they do this when myosin, the protein myosin, interacts with the protein actin and they form an interaction called a cross bridge. And this happens in a sequence of steps that you need to go through. So first of all, when we want a muscle to contract, we obviously send an impulse along a neuron towards the muscle. And this action potential travels to the muscle fiber or the muscle cell. And it does this via T tubules. And these are basically tubules which go in contact with the muscle cell and they sort of invaginate deep down into the cell. And eventually these T tubules come into contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cell. So remember, sarcoplasmic refers to muscle, or sarco refers to muscle. So sarcoplasm, for example, is the cytoplasm, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the ER of the muscle cell. So here we have our motor neuron. And the motor neuron sends an action potential down to the region where the neuron reaches the muscle cell, which is the neuromuscular junction. And the action potential will send an activation of the postsynaptic membrane. And eventually, when that postsynaptic membrane is excited, the action potential will go down into these tubules, which are the T tubules. There are multiple T tubules, and they go down to meet the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's the first step in making muscles contract. In the second step, as the action potential reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are calcium ions which are stored in the sarcoplasm. And the ion channels for these calcium ions open up, causing calcium to diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm, but in the muscle cell it's called the sarcoplasm. So we've got an action potential coming along, going down the T-tubules and activating these ion channels, which are found in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if we consider this would be the sarcoplasmic reticulum's lumen, and this would be the sarcoplasm. Then once these channels have been opened, the calcium can simply diffuse from where they're stored, where there's a high concentration, out to the sarcoplasm where there are very few of them. So that's the second step. So the calcium ions which have been released now bind to the protein which we mentioned in the previous video, which is troponin. So remember, we've got the muscle cell, which is a big cell, We've got the sarcoplasm and the SR here. And then running along a lot of the length of muscle cells are these myofibers or myofibrils. And remember, these are lots and lots of bundles of actin and myosin organized into sarcomeres. And when we zoom into a myofibril, we see this interaction where we have the actin protein here. And we've got this globular protein, which can bind to calcium, which is called troponin. So the calcium ions that have come out of the SR simply diffuse and they bind to a calcium binding site on the troponin. So here's a calcium ion. This interaction is really important because it causes the tropomyosin protein to move slightly and it exposes a part of the actin filament which is called the myosin binding site, which is found on the actin protein. So just to illustrate what's happening, we've got calcium binding to the protein called troponin. And as it does this, there's a protein interaction which occurs and it moves the tropomyosin protein, which is the long filamentous protein here. And on the actin protein, we have these binding sites which myosin can try and interact with, but usually they're covered up. So the interaction of calcium with this protein moves the tropomyosin out of the way so that these binding sites are now free and myosin can bind to them. So overall, this allows myosin to attach to the actin protein, and the interaction between them is called the actin-myosin cross bridge. So it's like a bridge between the proteins, hence why we call it a cross bridge. So here's all of these bundles of myosin protein, which are the thicker filaments. And then these beige circles represent the actin, which now have these exposed sites as the black sites, the black dots. And the tropomyosin molecule has been moved out of the way. So now the myosin and the actin can interact with each other at all of these sites, and this interaction would be the cross bridge. 
So once the myosin is attached to the actin, the heads of the myosin molecules, which are the bulbous heads, start to change their shape. So remember, this is all about protein interactions and shape changes. And they pull the actin filaments along, releasing a molecule of ADP. So here's our myosin proteins, all lined up. And here we have one myosin with its head as the bulbous structure of the protein. And essentially, as the interaction occurs at the cross bridge, the head changes shape and it moves from its original position to a new position. So it moves along the, the actin and it pulls the actin along in a particular direction as it does this. And in doing this, it releases a molecule of ADP. So as it releases ADP, the protein changes structure, which is the head of the myosin, and the change in structure shifts it along the actin, but essentially it pulls the actin in a particular direction. After this, a molecule of ATP attaches to the myosin head, so it's kind of replaced the, the ADP, and it changes shape again, and it detaches from the actin filament. So it's a switch between attaching to the actin in one shape or detaching in another shape. So the ATP comes along, binds to the myosin head, and then the myosin detaches from the actin so that they're now no longer attached. So now that we've got ATP bound, there are ATPase enzymes which were activated by the calcium that was released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And these enzymes are going to help break ATP down. So we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum in step one and two. The calcium ions left because of the action potential, and they activate ATPase enzymes into an active state. And remember, ATPase enzymes are designed to break down ATP. So now what happens is the ATPases break down the ATP, which we just said attached to the myosin heads, turning it into ADP and a phosphate. And again, it's going to change their shape back to the original shape. So the myosin heads return to their original position. So here's the ATP bound to the myosin. And now we have our active ATPase. And it's going to break the ATP down into ADP and a phosphate group. And as it does this, the interaction with the protein changes shape and it returns to its original position. So when you tie all this together, what's happening is we're starting with an exposure of the actin sites to the myosin so it can bind when it's bound to ADP. It then releases ADP, the head changes shape and it moves along the actin. And then it joins to ATP, the ATP gets broken down again and it changes shape again. So we've got the continuous cycle of breaking down ATP moving position along and pulling the actin in a particular direction. So when the myosin heads detach from the actin, they attach to another binding site which is further down, just one site down, down along the actin filament, and then the process repeats itself. So if you can imagine this head is kind of clawing its way across the actin at many different sites along this sarcomere, and eventually the actin is going to get pulled in a particular direction. So the actin molecules are all being pulled in the same direction across all the myofibrils in the whole muscle. And the process keeps repeating across cycles as long as calcium is released into the cell. And the process results in the actin filaments of one sarcomere being pulled in opposite directions. And they do so towards each other. So here's a sarcomere with two Z lines marking the sort of area of the sarcomere. And here we have the myosin and the actin. So the myosin's in red, and the actin is in blue. If you imagine one of these heads binds and then it burns or releases the ADP and then it moves along and then it takes an ATP and burns it again, moves along again, and the other side is doing the same but in the opposite direction, eventually the actins are going to be pulled in towards the middle. And when they do so, the length of the sarcomere will go down. And this is how, if you imagine this happening over all of the myofibrils, all the sarcomeres and all the muscle cells, then the whole muscle is going to contract and help its function in pulling whichever part of the skeleton it works for. As the filaments slide past each other in opposite directions, the sarcomere becomes shorter and this whole process is called the sliding filament model because the filaments are kind of interlocking and sliding around each other. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.